and we have chapters that talk about how George Floyd's death was used by the left to push diversity, equity, and inclusion far beyond anything anyone imagined. And I think we can do better. We can still have diversity. Uh, we need to get rid of diversity, equity, inclusion programs in the workplace, in college admissions. They're very harmful to racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, we can do a lot better. I want to talk to you about your book, of course, brand new book called The Adversity of Diversity. Uh, it says how real unity training can promote healing in a post-affirmative action world. The Adversity of Diversity. Carol Swain, what is your thesis? Well, the book, 90% of it was written before the Supreme Court issued its decision striking down race-based college admissions. And I anticipated that they would do that, even though I had fear that maybe they would not have the courage at the last minute. And so I argue that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs violate the Constitution and our civil rights laws in the same way, and that they too have an expiration date. And I believe that we've come to the point in American history where we need to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, sex, national origin, religion, and um, you know disabilities that's been added. But we had a civil rights law that was that was passed in 1964. And we also have the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution that protects all persons. And the Supreme Court used the Equal Protection Clause to strike down race-based affirmative action. And so we know that there's going to be a lot of defiance, but I argue that we can have a unity, we can have diversity without discrimination. And I have a chapter on my own journey. I started college in the 1970s, and by then, Affirmative action was everywhere, but I went to a community college. They admitted anyone who applied, uh, and I had been a high school dropout. Some people know my story. I was one of 12 kids, and at that community college- I'm sorry, college, did you I just say 12? I was one of 12. I want, I want, <laughs> I want people to hear that. That's, a, that's an extraordinary statement. For you to make, uh, I've heard we, you make uh, it in the past, but you were one of twelve children. That's an extraordinary thing. Uh, say a little bit more kids. about your story. Say say a little bit more about your story, please. Well, I mean, I, I was born and raised in rural Virginia, a little uh, hamlet called Chamlisburg, and the early part of my life was spent in a two-room shack with no indoor plumbing, and uh, the children uh, slept on the kitchen floor. And my stepfather and mother slept in, you know, I don't, the living room. So it was living room, kitchen. And um, and then later, my stepfather expanded the house. He added two rooms onto the back. And then the kids had a, um, uh, there was a boy's bed and a girl's bed. I have, I had seven brothers and four sisters. And so the kids all slept together and they were all different ages. And you can imagine how unpleasant that was. I was second from the oldest. And at some point we got electricity. And I can tell you that when people see my personality, there was a little electrical box, something on the wall that we were told that if you touched it, you would die. And I just couldn't believe that if you touched it, that you would really die. So I kept did the, watching Did the it serpent one day say I to you, it. Did the serpent say to you, you will not surely die? You will be as gods? <laughs> I don't know, but I, I touched that box, and I'm here to, to talk about I touched the box, and I survived. But that poverty was so grueling that there were sometimes when it would snow heavily, we didn't have boots and warm coats and stuff. We would stay home, and there was one year we missed 80 of 180 uh, school days, and I failed and all of my siblings failed. And I, I'm, I've started working on a memoir and I did the research and it looks like I failed at least twice um, in K through 12 before I dropped out at the eighth grade. I married at 16, had my first child at 17. By the time I was 21, I had three small children. Okay, hold on. And people came into I wanna, my life. I always want to slow this kind of <laughs> stuff down. You married at age 16. 
that was not so uncommon. In fact, uh, I I'm not got saying my it was uncommon, permission. but it's a significant thing. You married at age 16. By age 21, you had three children. Yes, and um, and you dropped out yeah, of school in eighth this. grade. Right, and 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 I uh, was not pregnant when I got married. I was always too smart for my own good. I saw marriage as a, a way to get out of that situation. And the man I married was a, a a few years older. He had a car and he had a job, and that was all that was necessary. So I married the first person I dated, and um, I was so thrilled that anyone had would have me. I also grew up with the complex that I was ugly. Uh, my siblings, um, they called me fish eyes and Frankenstein because I have a scar on the left side of my forehead that runs halfway down like Frankenstein. Isn't, isn't that what siblings are for? I think that's pretty normal right there. <laughs> but that's the most normal thing I've heard so far. But your story is extraordinary. Um, and, you know, you're... You're not old enough uh, to have grown up with 12 siblings in, in a two-room shack. Uh, and, you know, you go on and on. But the point is that this was, this was the reality not very long ago. And you are uh, a living example of what can happen in America. So you are, uh, your, your, your biography, your story is a slap in the face to the woke madness, uh, to the diversity nonsense that we're hearing, uh, and you, you know, not, you not only succeeded, you've succeeded, you've succeeded dramatically uh, in your in your life, and so you speak with authority on these issues. You're you're not just somebody that has a difference of opinion. You have lived this. You've paid your dues. So the book we're talking about is the adversity of diversity, and I would say as well, diversity doesn't even mean anything anymore. What does it mean? It, not, it, it's no, it's, but. Uh, they have polluted the word, and I can tell you, so I grew, I was born in the 50s and um, did not attend integrated schools until the late 1960s. That's how long it took. Just like the schools have vowed to resist the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, uh, they vowed to resist the Supreme Court uh, decision integrating schools. And so it took uh, that long, the late 60s, for integration to reach uh, Bedford County, Virginia. And um, and as far as how many of us lived in that shack, uh, there was probably about nine kids, nine of uh, children and two adults because eventually we moved out. And so these kids were born over time. And I, some of them were younger than my, I have siblings younger than my own children. <laughs> wow. It's, it's just, ex it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. But, but here's you, the thing. Yeah. I benefited from the, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but also amidst all that poverty and dysfunction, because my mother was an alcoholic, stepfather, a lot of abuse uh, between them. But she had that Protestant work ethic in a sense that she said, well, you know, we don't take charity. So we qualified for free lunches and free books. She would not sign up her children for free lunches or free books. And so I would have to study at school uh, because I couldn't take the books home, and um, and so that was part of the thing. She and they didn't. They never uh, blamed white people for our condition, and I didn't grow up around that. And I grew up believing that if you worked hard and you got an education, you could make something of yourself. And I also believed I lived in the greatest country in the world. And I was very proud to be an American. I was very proud to be an, a, Virgi a Virginian because I knew I came from the state uh, that produced presidents. And so I had a lot of pride as a child. And I also grew up about 10 miles from Booker D. Washington's birthplace. <laughs> and wow. so I read up from slavery. So that helped form my character as well. And and where did you uh, go to college? And and because I I met you, got to be about fifteen years ago now uh, at Princeton when you were still at Princeton. Well, I um, I went to a community college first, and I wanted to be an artist, and I was told to be practical, and I was the kind of person that followed advice, and so then I took business, which meant. I definitely needed that remedia math to get a, a two-year degree in business. I got it in two years. First uh, year, I didn't study, and I was making Cs. And I thought that was good for someone that didn't go to high school if they're making Cs. 
And then the second year, I decided to study, and I made the dean's list a couple of times. And then I applied for jobs. I wanted to be a store manager, and then I was told I needed a four-year degree. And I made a decision that I was going to be an honor student because I needed uh, something you to put on the job You made a decision to be an honor student? Who makes that kind of decision, folks? Who Do we believe this? We're going to be right back. We're talking to Carol Swain. <laughs> Let's finish with your story because it's such a fascinating story. Well, at that uh, community college, I started off as a work-study student, and because the regular employees wouldn't come in, a full-time job was created for me nights and weekends. And when I applied for jobs as a store manager, I was told I needed a four-year degree. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm going to be real here. I looked through the college catalog for Roanoke College, a Lutheran school. I looked for the degree that had the least amount of math, but I also made a decision to be uh, an honor student. So I was working in the library. I read books. I purchased books. I, uh, and on how to make A's in college, how to take essay exams, uh, how to take objective um, tests. And I applied those skills. And my first semester at Roanoke College, uh, I had a 3.7. And I ended up graduating magna cum laude. And I was not a, a devout Christian believer or anything at that time. But I can see the hand of God because that job was perfect. Nights and weekends, almost no one used the library nights and weekends. I could take my children to work when I needed to. And I was working 40 hours a week, going to school full time. And I graduated magna cum laude and I started a scholarship for minorities, an academic scholarship. And part of that had to do with the fact that I wanted an academic scholarship rather than need-based assistance. And uh, and they didn't have any that I qualified for. And so I decided I would create a scholarship that would be academic for minorities. Well, that's nuts right there. You shouldn't have brought that up because that's a huge <laughs> con conversation that here you, a nobody, you decide I'm going to start a scholarship fund. That's that's insane and amazing. Well, um, here's something that's real insane. In my life as a late teen, and while I was at Ronald College, several times, complete strangers came up to me and they said, you know, you're going to be famous someday. And it was nothing about what I was doing or the situation I was in or the struggle. I struggled with depression. I struggled with suicide gestures. Um, I, I had a sense always that there was something I was supposed to do. So in, within me was always a sense of urgency. But I was trapped. I was trapped in a bad marriage. I had children. I certainly couldn't see my future. and um, But I had these strangers that I believe God sent to encourage me. And in college, I took courses on psychology. And there was a course that taught, there was a, um, a concept, uh, delusions of grandeur. And I was afraid that I was suffering from that because even though I was trapped in that poverty, I had a sense of, of, of importance and... and <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's it's unbelievable. So you end up at Princeton, uh, then you were at Duke. Uh, you have run for office. Uh, you now you said now you're working on your memoir because that's the that's the book everybody has to read. When are you going to be done with that book? I I don't know because that's the book that gets put on the back burner. But I have five college and university degrees, and with Princeton, uh, that's where I started my career. I did not apply for any minority positions. And at Roanoke College, I wrote my master's, my uh, undergraduate uh, thesis, their equivalent to a thesis, independent study on affirmative action. I criticized affirmative action. And at that time, I was a liberal Democrat, you know, very close to my poverty. I saw the problems with it. And I quote from myself in my book, The Adversity of Diversity. I quote from that 1983 paper that I got an A plus on. Holy cow. We've only got a couple of minutes left. The book is, the new book is The Adversity of Diversity. Why should people get a copy of this book that I'm holding in my hand right now? Because I believe that Americans have lost sense of our civil rights laws and our Constitution. And I believe we got it right back when we passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Equal opportunity, non-discrimination, outreach and recruitment. I believe those were the factors that helped me become successful. Uh, there were people that were looking for talented minorities. 
I never uh, sought to go into academia. I was shy most of my life. And there were people that came alongside and they, you know, they pushed me to go in a direction that I never anticipated. Uh, most of these people were uh, older white men in academia. Uh, and, and, as a, and I see where we are today with race relations. And I want white people and Asian people and all people to know that they're protected by our civil rights laws or that, you know, that they have a recourse. And we have chapters that talk about how George Floyd's death was used by the left to push diversity, equity, and inclusion far beyond anything anyone imagined. And I think we can do better. We can still have diversity. Uh, we need to get rid of diversity, equity, inclusion programs in the workplace, in college admissions. They're very harmful to racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, we can do a lot better. Well, we're out of time, but uh, Carol, uh, I want to have you back as soon as possible. My producer, Chris, is here. We've got to book you because there's so much more to be said, and I realize that we're just scratching the surface. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the book is The Adversity of Diversity. You need to know Carol Swain, S-W-A-I-N. Uh, I predict, Rima word of knowledge, you're going to be famous someday, Carol. 